A couple in a sleepy southern town makes a terrible discovery. What made this case so difficult was the victim didn't seem to have an enemy in the whole town. Investigators turn to behavioral clues for answers. The way a victim is left at a crime scene tells us a lot about an offender. It was almost as if he was ashamed or he wanted to cover up what he had done. Lake City, Florida, nestled in the Suwannee River Valley. It's a place where people feel safe and secure. Until early one evening, when a frantic call comes in to 911. 911, what is your emergency? I think I found a dead body. Hold on. Hello? Hello. And what, what is your name? My name is Anthony Darby. Anthony Darby? Yes. What's the person's name that you think is uh, dead? Sammy Davis. <laughs> Officer Terrence Tyler races to the scene. From the front, the residence appeared to be secure. Front door was locked. And there were no signs of forced entry. Came around back, now the back door was open. I could see through the glass and I could see the victim. He's lying on the couch on his back. His face is covered by a pillow and he has several lacerations on his face. Sammy Davis is dead at the scene. Uh, we checked through the area for a weapon. Uh, we were not able to find one. But he does uncover something else of interest. We did find the victim's wallet lying on the floor next to the couch. Uh, the wallet was empty. We checked the rest of the home. Nothing else appeared to be disturbed. Police take Sammy's body to the medical examiner. Mr. Davis died of uh, chopping wounds to the head and neck. We see a lot of stabbings, but uh, this type is very rare. The murder weapon would have been a machete, a hatchet, meat cleaver, something like that. And that's not the only thing that is unusual about Sammy's death. Normally we look for defensive wounds on the forms. Uh, Sammy Davis had no defensive wounds whatsoever. The next morning, Sheriff Bill Godey joins the investigation. We knew that Sammy Davis cut hair, was a hairstylist, so it was very important for us to talk with his co-workers to retrace the steps that Sammy made hours before his death. Sheriff Godey learns that Sammy Davis was seen at the beauty salon just hours before he was killed. Records indicated that Sammy made over 400, close to $500 that night. Is that a list of his clients as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. When we questioned the co-workers about where he normally kept that amount of cash. He said he normally put it in his wallet. The very same wallet that police found at the crime scene, empty. At approximately 10 p.m., he left the beauty shop. At that late at night, this busy intersection, there was a possibility that somebody might have been watching and waiting and followed Sammy home. At this point, I thought it was a potential robbery. However, the list of suspects were endless, and we had no physical evidence to, de to develop a suspect. Sheriff Godey calls in criminal profiler Dale Hinman. I can do that. 
We can tell a lot about a crime from the type of injuries that were inflicted. But it's an injury that Sammy Davis does not have that catches Agent Hinman's interest. There was no physical evidence to support any type of confrontation or any resistance on the part of the victim. It looked like the victim was asleep when he was attacked. If someone had entered Sammy's home after he was asleep and the purpose was to steal his money, they could have taken the money and just left. But that didn't happen here, so there must have been some other motive for this crime. Perhaps a motive like revenge. But Sammy Davis does not have any enemies, at least none that the Sheriff's Department knows about. Will Agent Hinman be able to uncover the offender's identity? popular hairdresser, Sammy Davis, is attacked and killed inside his home. Police suspect a robbery gone wrong, but Agent Hinman thinks the offender may have had a more malicious motive. Since the victim was attacked and killed while he was asleep, it appeared to be a more angry attack on a targeted victim. Agent Hinman visits the crime scene with Sheriff Gody, looking for any additional clues to the offender's identity. Was there any indication of forced entry into the home? The front door was locked. A uh, sliding glass door was partially open, but there was no sign of forced entries anywhere. So it sounds like the victim let the offender into the home. Was there an instrument in the, in the home that would make these wounds? The medical examiner uh, said that it could possibly have been an axe or a meat cleaver. Mm -hmm. uh, from witnesses said that there had been uh, a meat cleaver in the home, but we didn't find it. So it sounds like it's a weapon of opportunity. It must have been there for some other reason to begin with, and some event occurred that changed the reason why he was there from being someone who knew the victim to someone who had killed the victim. Right. But it's what happened after the killing that intrigues Agent Hinman. He was laying on a pull-out couch, and there was a pillow covering his face. Well, that's interesting. Um, makes me think that the individual didn't want to look at his face and covered his face up, perhaps as a feeling of remorse or didn't want to see what he had done. It doesn't sound like the money is the issue. It sounds more like the victim was the issue. Well, based on the fact that you have no forced entry into the house, that the victim was asleep at the time the attack was initiated, you have a weapon of opportunity that was from inside of the home. Sounds like the victim and the offender knew each other and they had some type of relationship prior to the night of his death. Based on this information, Sheriff Gody looks into Sammy's friends and family for a possible suspect. We learned through uh, the interviews with his family and friends that uh, Sammy Davis was homosexual. However, he had no ongoing relationship with any one person. He was very well known in the community. He was very generous. He would give people a place to stay when they were in need. One uh, lady that Sammy took in was Juanita Whitaker. A lot of times uh, Juanita would have her boyfriend, they would have arguments and she wouldn't have a place to stay. So Sammy Davis, being a good friend, would let her stay the night. And when Sheriff Gody interviews her friends, he learns that Juanita and her boyfriend had a particularly bad fight the night of Sammy's murder. Thank you very much. She stormed out of the house and said that she was going to spend the night at Sammy Davis's house. Armed with this new information, Investigators run a routine background check on Juanita Whitaker. Juanita Whitaker had been arrested on drug charges, uh, petty theft. Could Juanita be involved in Sammy's murder? All of the victim's friends and co-workers described the relationship between Sammy and Juanita as being very close. There was no reason for her to be angry at him or to harm him. But she was at his house that night, so the police needed to interview her to find out what she knew. Police bring her in for questioning. When's the last time that you saw Sammy Davis alive? Monday morning. Monday morning, about what time? Clock 12. About 12 a.m.? Yes, sir. And we was just sitting there. 
sitting there talking, having a good time, and then I said, well, I'm gonna spend the night. But uh, he said, oh, you can't stay too long tonight because I might have company. So I went there, went in the refrigerator, and um, asked for a piece of red velvet cake, and I ate that, and I left. Oh, I'm skipping something now. It was, uh, it was tap on the wonder. Sammy Davis said that uh, he was expecting someone and asked her to leave, but by the front door. She said she left Sammy's, went to a local convenience store. We went to the uh, convenience store. We pulled the uh, security video camera, the tape. I reviewed it, and in fact, she was there. Juanita's story checks out. Juanita's interview provided an interesting detail. Sammy told Juanita that it was expecting company that night and she would have to leave. But when the person arrived, instead of coming to the front door, he went around and knocked on the back window. It was obvious he didn't want to be seen by Juanita. But before Agent Hinman can follow up on this clue, Another body is discovered nearby on the bank of the Suwannee River with distinct chop wounds to the victim's neck. We have speculated that it could possibly be an axe or a meat cleaver or a, a large hunting knife. Two men dead, both with unusual injuries to the neck. Is it just a coincidence or will it lead to Sammy's killer? Another man in Lake City, Florida, has turned up dead with unusual wounds to his neck. Special Agent Dale Hinman meets with police to determine if the crime is related to Sammy Davis's murder. Dale, this is another homicide victim, uh, Ronald Gatlin, whose body was found here on the banks of the Suwannee River. He has some similar injuries as Sammy Davis. So he's got sharp force injuries to the neck? He has multiple sharp injuries to the neck. Did your victim have any defensive wounds? Uh, no defensive wounds. Where do you think the victim was killed? Uh, evidence indicates that he was killed uh, on a sofa in a, in a mobile home. Was anything missing from the mobile home? The only thing that was missing was cash from his wallet, approximately $60. A man killed on a sofa, chopping wounds, an empty wallet. It's all very similar to Sammy Davis's murder. But Agent Hinman is skeptical that they are related. What's really significant about this case is the fact that Mr. Gatlin was moved to this location. I think the offender didn't want him to be found. But Mr. Davis's killer left the back door unlocked. The position that he left him in with the, the pillow over his face, I think that he felt really badly about this crime. And he wanted somebody to find the body and find the body pretty quickly. So even though there's some really marked similarities, I think the killer is not the same person. Since we didn't think that these cases were related, we decided to refocus our efforts on trying to get to the bottom of who had knocked on Sammy Davis's window the night he was killed. It was, uh, it was tap on the window. Hinman reviews Juanita's interview. She was pausing before she was answering many of the questions. It sounded like she knew more about what may have happened the night of the murder. But why would Juanita be withholding information? Hinman meets with Sheriff Godey to explore a potential theory. I'm wondering if the reason why this is is she has some fear of law enforcement. Has she ever been arrested in the past? She has, uh, by the Columbia County Sheriff's Office. She has some minor drug charges. Were there ever any reports of any drug activity at the victim's home? And there were some reports that there might have been some drug use at his home. Perhaps that may be something to do with why Juanita's not very forthcoming in her information about what happened that night. And Agent Hinman has an idea for getting Juanita to talk. Perhaps if I went over there and spoke to her woman to woman and explained to her that 
we're not interested in any minor drug activity that may have occurred in the residence. What we're interested in was who was there and who committed this murder and how can she help us. Perhaps she'll give me a more consistent account of what occurred there that night. I went to Juanita's home to see if I could get her to tell me the truth about what happened the night Sammy was killed. After a couple of hours, Hinman's strategy begins to pay off. I didn't go right exactly to see Sammy Dan. I got a cup of drink and got some weed and smoke and stuff. Juanita told me that she occasionally used drugs, and on the night of the murder, she went over to Sammy Davis's house to party. The key witness in Sammy Davis's murder reveals that she had been partying at the victim's house the night of the murder. One of the reasons we decided to go and re-interview Juanita was to try to determine the identity of the person who had knocked on the window the night Sammy was murdered. Once Juanita realized that we were not trying to charge her for using drugs, we only wanted to solve her friend's murder, then she admitted she recognized the man who had come there that night. And who was at the house? Anthony. I left him at the house. And what was Anthony doing? Tripping. Anthony Darby, the same man who had found Sammy's body and called 911 to report it. And what, what is your name? Uh, my name is Anthony Darby. Anthony Darby? Yes. Yeah. Offenders often interject themselves into investigations to attempt to determine what law enforcement knows or to try to influence the case. That's a red flag for us. Darby is brought in for questioning. He admits he saw Sammy the night of the murder. He opened the door to that man. We talked for a little while. He said he was tired. I said I was tired. So I pulled out the couch. Did y'all smoke anything or anything? I smoked some crack. Darby tells police that he fell asleep on the sofa in the living room. Several hours later, he woke up with a start and found Sammy next to him. I woke up. I looked around and I said, God damn. Anthony Darby said he woke up. He didn't know if anything sexually had happened. Uh, he just kind of freaked out. But Agent Hinman doesn't buy it. She thinks Darby is just making excuses for what happened next. If Anthony was responding to what he thought was an inappropriate sexual advance, then why did he wait until Sammy went to sleep to attack him? Why did he cover his face? Why did he stage the crime scene to make it look like it might have been a robbery and then remove all the evidence from the scene? But if Darby's motive wasn't an unwanted sexual advance, then what was it? According to Juanita, Sammy told her that Anthony had become very abusive toward him and he was planning on telling him to stay away. And when told to stay away, Anthony Darby flew into a rage. He went into the, the other room, he grabbed a meat cleaver, he went back in and struck Sammy Davis in the throat and the head. What'd you do then? Well, I said, well... Anthony Darby took the $500 from Sammy's wallet and fled the scene. When three days had passed and no one had discovered the body, Anthony Darby asked his girlfriend to drive him over to Sammy's house. I knocked on the front door and I got no answer, which I kind of expected. I was going to get back in the car, but then I say, no, this is a good time as any to find it because I got somebody with me. Anthony said that if he found Sammy's body with his girlfriend present, the police would not think he was involved in the murder. So instead of getting in the car, I went around to the back of him. He was there. He was just like he was when I left. So I went out and got her, put on one of my Oscar winning performances. A performance that landed him in jail. After a brief trial, Anthony Darby is convicted for the murder of his friend, Sammy Davis, and is sentenced to 25 years to life. 
Sammy Davis was a kind and generous man who was a friend to everyone he met. Sadly, it was someone who was close to him who betrayed him and took his life. Thanks to the hard work and dedication of everyone involved in this investigation, we were able to bring Sammy Davis the justice he deserved.